real good feeling about what God is going to do in his world this year. Just a really good feeling. I think he is doing a good work and I believe he is encouraging and inviting his people to church to be a part of that. Amen. Last week I had announced that we'll start a new series out of the book of Malachi today. And uh, that was uh, my intention until the Lord changed that plan. When he changed our travel plans to Tanzania next week, our flights got canceled and rescheduled to leave on Sunday morning next week. So I won't be with you next week. So I thought it would not be a great plan to start a series today and then miss immediately following. So I'm going to just share a message that God has placed on my heart in the form of a challenge today about what this year is going to be about. I have already said, I, I believe with all of my heart that what's been happening in the last couple of years has not been um, without God's sovereign control. Let me just put it that way. People say, well, Pastor, do you think that God is causing all of these things to happen in his world? Well, I'm not going to get into that discussion this morning. What I will say is that I believe that God is at work in his world always. And he would not let something as big as what's happened in the world the last couple years go unnoticed or go without turning these things. You remember what Joseph said to his brothers? He says, what, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. God's got a good idea about what happens next in his world. And I believe that. And I believe he's going to let us be a part of that. So I want you to get ready. I want to be ready. And I want to look forward to what is going to happen as the world begins to rethink what it means to be the people of God. As the children of God begin coming together again and, and rebounding, if you will. There's been a lot of revival taking place already. A lot of churches are really having to ask hard questions like we have had to ask over the last couple of years. Questions about priorities and values and what's really important. And what could we do without and what could we not do without? And there's been a, a pruning, if you will, of things that are not necessarily necessary. And God has been doing a good work in and through us. And I have, I have sensed your um, interest and your anticipation of what happens next. These questions that started out as questions of fear and worry like where is this all going to end or what's going to happen next have turned into questions of expectation and anticipation. I wonder what God is going to do next. I'm hearing that. We're looking forward to seeing the hand of God at work in his world. And so as I begin this year with you, I want you to begin dealing with a personal question about your own spiritual condition. And I'm going to break it down and make this challenge very, very simple because I'm going to ask a very simple question. How good of a Christian are you? Is that something we ever think about? Is it something that you spend time wondering, well, could I, could I be better, could I be worse, or I used to be better, or not so much now, or I've kind of backslid a little bit, or, or I, look for, you know, I look forward to a better day, or is it something that's just not a part of our, our everyday experience? I mean, do you just assume, well, I'm a Christian, and that's good enough? How good a Christian are you? That's not that hard a question. Think about it for a minute. Pretty good. Maybe average, maybe not so much. How good a Christian are you? I have this suspicion, and I think it's true. I've been doing this for a long time as far as leading one of God's churches and, and being a part of what God is doing in this world and working with Christians and Christian people. And I have this theory, and I, I think it's true, and that is I, I, my theory is that Christians tend to set a ceiling for their spirituality and their Christian faith. Ceiling. Which means whether you acknowledge it or not, whether you've written it down, whether you really think about it or not, the reality is, is that deep down inside of you somewhere, there is this Christian life ceiling, and, and, and you're not going to go past it. You just kind of live up to that ceiling. 
And I've seen it. And for some, that ceiling's pretty low, actually. I'll be honest with you. I mean, the, I guess the low end of the ceiling was, I want to go to heaven when I die. Past that, not so much. That's about as low as the ceilings you can get, right? And then others, they have a higher ceiling that says, well, no, I want to be active in the Lord's church. I want to be a part of what God is doing in this world. So I'm going to... Some say, well, you know, as long as I'm, I'm a prayer warrior and I want, to, I want to be good at praying because you never know when you might need a good prayer or somebody might come to you to pray for them. So, so that's, that's kind of my ceiling. Some would say, I want to know a little bit about the Bible, but all those deep theological things I don't really need. And, and so deep down, we tend to have this ceiling. And if that's true, and I, I think it is, but if it's true, I want to be very clear about something this morning as I, as I challenge you for the year 2022. My goal for today or for this year is not to encourage you to raise your ceiling. I'll make that very clear. My goal is to challenge you to remove your ceiling. And just let God have the freedom to do in you whatever God wants to do in you. And to keep growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. I think we could argue that as we read the New Testament, we realize that people like Paul and Timothy and John and Peter and James. I think think we would have to agree that these great, great men of God never thought that they had arrived. They were always striving, always growing, always looking for more. And that's what I want in my own Christian life. And that's what I want for you. I want you to realize that that to walk in newness of life, as we're called to do, means that if we've been here before, we're not new. Newness of life means that we take a step further than we've taken before. We grow a little more than we've grown before. We, We learn a little more than we've learned before. We are closer today than we were yesterday. And our goal is to be closer tomorrow than we are today. We need to remove those ceilings. How good a Christian are you? Our passage for this morning is 2 Timothy chapter 2. I love this passage. I'm just going to read one verse and we're going to pick it apart a little bit, talk a little bit about what Paul is doing. As Paul is writing to Timothy, Timothy is his protege, if you will. Paul is a mentor to a younger Timothy. He's been his teacher. He's been his pastor. He's, He's been like a father figure to him. And he's watched this young man grow. But in chapter 2, in verse 15, in this letter that he sent to Timothy, he gives a very specific and unique command to this young minister. And here's what he says. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Now look at it carefully. Paul is writing to his student. He's writing a letter because he's not there with him at the time. So there are no morning Bible studies with the master. There are no long walks in the afternoon where they can talk about doctrine and theology, where they can talk about spiritual things. There is no supervision of ministry where Paul is walking him through different ministry opportunities. He's not there with him. And so you might think that Timothy kind of has a break from all of this spiritual growth because his mentor is not able to be with him. But Paul says this, No, Timothy, you need to do your best to present yourself as one who does not need to be ashamed. Paul says, Timothy, it's your job. It's your responsibility. As a matter of fact, as you look at at this this word, when I I study scripture and I'm getting ready to preach or teach about that scripture, and this would be a good idea for you to do as well, I typically like to get multiple English translations on my desk at the same time. And I will read a passage of Scripture in those multiple translations. And and most of the time, they're very similar. But every once in a while, I'll find a, a, a verse that looks different. Or words that are obviously translated differently. And that's when I get in a little deeper in my study. I want to say, well, what are they going after here? And when I looked at this passage, I began to realize that very thing was taking place. I just read the ESV, which said, do your best. 
The King James Version says to study. The Living Bible says to work hard. The New English Bible said to try hard. The New American Standard said be diligent. Another said make every effort. Yet another, concentrate on doing your best. They're all getting at something, aren't they? And so I looked up the word, and the word in the Greek New Testament is spaudatezo. You don't need to remember that. But as I studied that word, at the heart of that word is initiative. Initiative. Take the initiative. You take initiative, Timothy. I want you to do it. It's an imperative. It's a command. Timothy, don't wait on me to come back to town before you start studying the Word. Get into the Word. Timothy, don't wait on me to lead you to a time of prayer and devotion every day. Get into your prayer and your devotion every day. Timothy, don't wait on me to help you to grow in your faith. But you take the initiative to do your best, to do your part, to get engaged. And as I, as I read that, I realize that we have a lot of folks who are a lot like Timothy in the church today. They're waiting on someone else to take the initiative to lead them in their spiritual growth. Whether that be a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or a parent or a spouse. And your excuse is, well, I'm just kind of waiting on them to lead, but we're not really getting it done here. And I, I want you to know that Scripture does not give you a hall pass just because somebody who you think to be a spiritual leader is not doing his or her task of leading you. It comes right back to us. It's an imperative. It's an imperative to take the initiative. Timothy, I want you to do this. So I'm going to ask again, how good a Christian are you? What is your spiritual life like? Is it growing? Is it developing? Or is it stagnant? How high is your ceiling? What are you doing to show yourself as an approved worker before God? Rightly dividing His Word. So this morning my challenge is for you to pick up that command of God that's exactly what it is it's an imperative it's a command I challenge you to pick it up and realize that God through his word is asking you what are you doing and the challenge says are you doing your best to show yourself approved and I would pray that all of us would realize that God is doing something in his word world I believe that and I want to do my best to be found ready to serve him when it comes you know, I, I get this sometimes, and, and, and people tend to equate spiritual development with service opportunities. In other words, they would say, you know, and I get this sometimes, when, when I taught that class, I learned so much. As long as I'm serving, I've got a reason to study. And, and I think there's, there's some truth in that. I'm going to talk about service in a few minutes. There's, there's, there's some truth in that. But here's the key. I want to say this. If God never allows me to preach another sermon publicly in my lifetime, I'm still going to want to get into his word every day and be ready just in case. And be ready. Are you ready to live out your Christian faith just in case God picks you to do a great work in your community, in your family, in your school, in your church? So we're going to talk a few minutes today about spiritual excellence. And I thought I would start just giving, giving some, some straight up guidance on what gets in the way. I want to look at some of the enemies of spiritual excellence for a few minutes. And the one that, that I think jumps off the page at me more often than not, and I see this in my own life, and yes, I see it in some of yours, is, is just plain old everyday apathy. Apathy. This is an unconcern about our spiritual condition. I just don't care. Some of you have experienced apathy already this morning. You know the topic is about spiritual growth and you're like, yeah, well, I'm pretty cool with my ceiling. 
It's all good. I'm all good, Pastor. I hope these other people are listening to you. Because I'm checking out right now. Don't need any of that touchy-feely stuff. I'm good. Apathy. If that's your heart cry, let me give you this warning from Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. Jesus is talking to the church at Laodicea. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to believers. He's talking to the church. And he says to them, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you from my mouth. Paraphrase, Jesus says, you need to lose that apathetic attitude. Get with it. You know the old saying, lead or follow or get on up out of the way. Kind of what we're reading about here. Do something. But let's lose this spirit that says, I'm good enough. I don't really need that. I'm okay where I am. Apathy. An unconcern. Complacency is another word that we use sometimes. This is is just a contentment with that spiritual condition. Now, I find this to be true. Watch this, and I'm going to get very specific. I find this to be true, more true than not, with regular attenders and servants of the Lord in His church. I find that to be true. This is uh, contentment happens or, or complacency happens when we feel as though we're doing it right already and we're satisfied with that. Good to go, go to church every week. I'm in. Read my Bible, got my little Bible study thing going on in the mornings. I pray, witness occasionally, serve. Good to go. So, so all I've done from apathy to complacency is just raise the ceiling a little bit. You see where this is going? See how this works? The ceiling's a little higher. That's good. But the attitude's still pretty much the same. I'm there. There's not going to be any growth in that. I mean, keep in mind, Paul wrote this to Timothy, by the way. Timothy. <laughs> Timothy. Right? Great man of God. Paul said, Timothy, you need to get with it. Don't give up. You're not there yet. Study to show yourself approved. I think often of Matthew chapter 15, and and I won't read that this morning, but in chapter 15 is, is where we see the Pharisee and the publican, and they're praying, and Jesus says, which one of them is better? Jesus says, woe, woe, you scribes and Pharisees. You think you're there, but you're not. You're not. Yeah, let's, let's do read that passage. This, I, I think you need to see that. that I, I want to I show you, because this is, this is what I'm talking about when I talk about those in the church. The Pharisees were there. He says, the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, can we get that? Maybe. All right, well, let's do it the old-fashioned way. We'll look it up. I want you to see this passage, Matthew chapter 15. Verse 1, follow him, look it up. Because here's, here's a message to, to, the, to church members, I think. Uh, complacent church members. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. And he answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or his mother... What you would have gained from me is given to God. He need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah the prophet say, what did Isaiah the prophet say to you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. All right. So, great challenge there. It's a great challenge to the church today. 
Because you people got plenty of good religious traditions and you're okay, but that's your ceiling. You're not getting past that. It doesn't have the right meaning and the right merit for you as a child of God as you're growing and, and, and striving to be more and more like him. Complacency. Disobedience is another one of these hindrances to spiritual excellence. When I was growing up, one of my favorite biblical characters as a young boy was was Samson. Don't we love us some Samson? Samson is the perfect biblical character for a teenage boy. Perfect. Got the long flowing hair. You see, I grew up in the 70s. That was cool. My mama wouldn't let me wear my hair down there long and I used to say, but what about Samson? Yeah, you know. And he had muscles. I could just see this guy. I know he had muscles. Superhuman strength. Break things and fight battles. I love me some Samson. Then I got a little older and I decided to read the story. <laughs> Not hero material. He couldn't get out of his own way. He disobeyed at every turn. And he kept getting in trouble and God would deliver him and get in more trouble. God would deliver him and get in more trouble. He couldn't stop. Disobedience. And then finally one day, there was no turning back. You know the story. The old haircut came along because of his disobedience. And he never got to do really what God had intended for him to do from his very beginning because he couldn't get out of his own way. And so many of us are there. We, we want to be good Christians, but we also want to hang out with the world and do our thing our way. We want to participate in what's going on. And we want to have all of the, the, the sins of the world to become a part of our lives. And, and, it's, and it's, it's, it stifles our, our walk with the Lord. Disobedience. And then for some, it's just prideful satisfaction. That's, a, that's an enemy of excellence. Prideful about our spiritual condition. And there are people that are there. Always wanting to tell you about all the good things they've done for the Lord. Testimony services become prideful self-accolades. And I did this and I did this and oh and I did that. I'm such a great Christian, look at me. It will, it will become an enemy of growth. You feel like, man, you've arrived. You're there. So we have apathy and complacency and disobedience and satisfaction. All those things get in the way of spiritual growth, and they're not where we need to be. And I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to come back to the message in just a moment, but I'm going to stop right here. And I'm going to ask you to bow your head. So we go to the Lord in prayer right now in the middle of, this, middle of the service. We're going to do an invitation in just a couple minutes. But before I even get to the invitation, I think we need to deal with this. The Bible says, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. But if you will confess your sin, God is faithful and just and will forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from every unrighteousness. In this context, apathy is a sin before God. Complacency is a sin before God. Disobedience is a sin before God. Self-satisfaction is a sin before God. If any or all of those represent you, I'm going to give you a chance right now just to confess it before the Lord. On the first Sunday of the new year and say, God, I am so sorry because I have been apathetic about my own Christian life. I'm so sorry because I have been complacent. I'm so sorry because I've been living in disobedience. I'm so sorry because I have been self-satisfied. And I'm going to ask you to forgive me right now. And restore my soul. And give me a hunger and a thirst for you. Father, we ask for cleansing today. Of those things that get in the way of growing. Those things that get in the way of us doing our best to show ourselves approved of you. Today we want to... Do something that matters for you and for your kingdom. And that something starts with repentance. Forgive us, O oh God. 
We thank you that you provide forgiveness, you promise forgiveness, and you give freely. We accept that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Okay. So let's look. If those are the enemies, let's very quickly, I'm going to give you one, two, three, four, five, five things. You might jot these down to do this year that will help you to, to remove that ceiling and begin on your journey of spiritual excellence. Number one is humility, a broken and contrite spirit. You know, half of what we just talked about is centered in pride, apathy, complacency, satisfaction. That's all rooted in pride. You got to get, you got to get over yourself. That's, that's where it starts. Psalm 51, verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. That's what he's looking for, a broken and contrite spirit. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, and verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. It is a, a broken spirit, a humility that says, God, I need more and more of you. Number two, devotion. Devotion. We, we have to get, get after it. I'm talking about getting to the Word daily, spending time with God in prayer daily, dedicated to doing it on a daily, regular basis. Prayer, Bible study, quiet time. Jesus said, a disciple is one who is devoted unto, and we want to be devoted unto him. The Apostle Paul, in a lot of his writings, used the illustration of athletics and the athlete because he understood the fact that an athlete didn't just participate in, in physical activity on game day, but had to do all of this preparation and training day after day after day and dedicated to it and committed to it so that on game day, he or she would be ready for the game. Spiritually speaking, we are have that kind of devotion every day. Seeking to grow, seeking to learn, seeking to get closer to Him. Devotion. Number three is worship. Worship, an expression of adoration that, that will result in unity between you and God. Worship. Here's, here's one of the biggest challenges I have for you for 2022. Uh, can, will you just determine to make 22 a year of worship for you? And here's what I mean. Let's take what we're doing right now this hour on Sunday morning and just move it off the table. Okay? I'm going to invite you back. I want to see you here every week. But I'm talking about a personal worship that happens on a daily basis. What does that look like for you? To daily worship the Lord. Here's, here's why I think that it's so critically important in, in spiritual growth. I think that when we worship God, we acknowledge His goodness, His greatness, His holiness, His splendor. It motivates us to be more like Him. It motivates us to be more in line with what He has intended for us. It motivates us to grow. It motivates us to mature spiritually. Why? Because we have been in the presence of the King. You remember in Isaiah chapter 6, here's a prophet of God who had been serving as a prophet of God. And then he said, I was in the temple on the Lord's day. Well, that's where he was supposed to be on the Lord's day. But then something unusual happened. He said, then I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Now he's in the presence of the Lord. And things begin to change rapidly for him because his next word was, whoa, am I. It was being in the presence of the Lord in worship. That motivated him to move further. And then a little later on in that passage, the Lord said, Who will go for us and whom shall I send? And, and Isaiah was like, oh, 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 send me, send me, send me. I'm ready. He'd been in the presence of the Lord. And if you're not in the presence of the Lord, I'm just going to straight up say it. If you're not spending time in the presence of the Lord daily, you're going to see no need to grow closer to him. You won't be motivated to get into his word. You won't be motivated to pray. You won't be motivated to serve. Why? Because you are not close to the source. Worship. Service is the next one. Service, and it has been well spoken. You've heard me say it many times. Others have said it, written on it. Service is the exercise of our faith. If you say in order for us to be healthy physically, we have to have nutrition, Food, we have to have air, 
and we have to have some kind of physical exercise. Those are things that we know support us physically. Well, spiritually, you can say that our food, our nourishment is the Word of God, that our breathing, our air that we breathe is prayer as we connect to the Lord, and our physical exercise is service to the Lord. It's how we stretch out these spiritual muscles. And I know some of you are afraid of that because you haven't done it in so long that atrophy has set into your spiritual muscles and you're like, oh, I can do that. Well, we want to help you to kind of get back into the, the swing of things. You may have to start slow, but start. Find some service and some ministry that you can do and that you can be a part of as you serve those around you. And then the last one, number five, and I'll close with this, is sacrifice. The sacrifice of yourself, as it says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, that we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord. But also the sacrifice of your time, your energy, your resources. As we trust the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to invest. I'm going to invest in my growth. I'm going to invest in my Christian life. I'm going to invest in your kingdom. I'm not going to just try to sit back and get something for nothing. I'm willing to give of myself, my time, my energy, my efforts, my heart before you. And 2022 can be a year of growth. And I'm looking forward to that. Really am. That that becomes a priority for us as a church. Discipling. Jesus said, go into the world and make disciples. Disciples are those who are devoted, those who are dedicated, those who are growing and maturing in Christ. That's what he wants of us. And that's what I'm calling you to today. A year of growth. How good a Christian are you? My prayer is that when and if I ask you again this time next year, your answer will be, better, so much better. Thank you for viewing this message from Old Fort Baptist Church. Here at OFBC, we value biblical truth, missional living, and vital connections. To learn more about who we are and what we do, please visit us online at oldfortbaptist.org. To help support the ongoing ministry of the church, you can give at oldfortbaptist.org forward slash give. Thank you and God bless.